You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast on the IoT for All Media Network. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon, one of the co-creators of IoT for All. Now, before we jump into this episode, please don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or join our newsletter at iotforall.com slash newsletter to catch all the newest episodes as soon as they come out. So without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the IoT for All podcast. Welcome, Larry, to the IoT for All show. Thanks for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. Yeah, it's great to have you. I'm excited about this conversation. It's a topic that we do not cover very often. So um, really looking forward to getting our audience some more information around blockchain and all those exciting things going on on that side of the world. Um, I wanted to start off by just having you kind of take us through your background maybe a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about you as a person, kind of your experience um, in just the tech space, how you ended up at IOTechs and you know, just kind of go from there. And then we'll jump into more about the company itself. Absolutely. My name is Larry, uh, born and raised in Los Angeles, California and uh, was educated at MIT in Boston. And there I studied economics and finance. Uh, They say when you don't know what to do after college, you go into consulting. So that's exactly (laughs) what I did. Um, I joined Oliver Wyman, which is a strategy consulting firm based out of New York, uh, and spent five years there, which is a a really long time in the consulting space. But uh, the concept of doing projects every three months and working with brand new teams, brand new clients, was just really attractive to me. And through that, it was kind of like a grad school in a way, uh, but more of a professional flavor to it. Um, My focus was on digital transformation. So at that time, between 2013 and 2018, was really about moving clients from data centers to the cloud, uh, a lot of things about data analytics. And through that, really got to see a lot of the mess that enterprises deal with from an infrastructure perspective, um, as well as how third-party vendors play in to fill the gaps and did a lot of buy versus build assessments. So got to sit at the intersection of operations, front office and technology Mm -hmm. and learn how to speak all the languages across those functions. So uh, I never envisioned going into tech out of college. I thought I was going to go more specifically into finance. But then I found out about blockchain, which is a very interesting marriage of technology and economics. Um, It's kind of a a open, decentralized uh, vision for the future but with predefined incentives uh, that really make um, the flow of value and flow of information around the network uh, more viable, right? And Mm -hmm. that definitely started with Bitcoin, Um, my interest in it, um, just seeing the applications in borderless payments and just, you know, a lot of people talk about replacement as gold, but, um, you know, it's really important to think about it as a brand new way of doing things. And that's exactly the the reaction I got when I heard about IOTEX as well, we're really approaching the IOT space, uh, but from a brand new perspective uh, focused on empowering users and empowering everyday people and businesses to not only own and control their devices, machines, but also to benefit from the data and value that those machines generate. Mm-hmm. And we call this vision, the internet of trusted things. Happy to dive in more uh, into the blockchain world and how we view uh, its application in IOT. Yeah, before we get into the blockchain, let's talk a little bit more about the company itself and kind of what you all do. Um, and then that vision you just mentioned um, about the, you know, the Internet of, of Trusted Things and how that uh, kind of relates to kind of what you all do. So maybe we we'll talk a little bit more about just the company itself to give our audience some insights there. Absolutely. So IOTech started in 2017 as an open source project. Um, we launched our production platform in 2019 and since then have started to now power the first really user-owned, user-centric devices that go along to that theme that I mentioned before around consumers and everyday businesses can own their information and you know, really spark new economies on top of it. Um, in addition to that, you know, IOTEX has taken leadership roles in a lot of professional enterprise organizations like the Industrial Internet Consortium, mm-hmm. IEEE, Confidential yep. Computing Consortium, just to name a few. And that's really to introduce blockchain to the global enterprise space. Um, Our real focus at IOTEX is all about combining blockchain, which is a tamper-proof software, and secure hardware, uh, which is more of like a tamper-proof hardware, um, in order to empower end-to-end trusted solutions that are verifiable by anyone. Um, Going into the concept of blockchain a bit, you know, it's a very transparent, and in my opinion, it's it's a great proactive technology. If you get people to, you know, kind of operate under the same operating rules, and the mm-hmm. same standards, then you can have multi-stakeholder collaboration 
even across people that don't trust each other due to the transparency and the verifiability that IOTEX provides. So right. when we think about this blockchain and IoT intersection, we're not only thinking about how blockchain can help solve many of the issues of traditional IoT that's currently mm-hmm. plagued by security and transparency, but also about how IoT can help blockchain to bring verifiable data to feed different applications that run uh, in a decentralized fashion as well. So that's a little Fantastic. bit uh, just about IoTex. Yeah, it's great. So let's um, let's dive into blockchain a little bit more. It's a term and uh, you know technology people have probably heard tons and tons about over the years recently especially um, but probably don't understand it very well um, I know personally it's a very confusing topic to understand and wrap your head around so I wanted to dive into this a bit further and have you just start off first by explaining what blockchain is in the simplest form possible and then we can get into kind of how it works how it connects and adds value to IOT and what are those issues that you just mentioned that blockchain can come in and solve Absolutely. You know, before we talk about what blockchain is, I think it's important to say what blockchain isn't. You okay. know, a lot of people think about blockchain as synonymous with Bitcoin, but it's sure. not. Blockchain is the technology that underpins Bitcoin as kind of this decentralized uh, model for uh, store of value in the future. But just breaking down blockchain as a, at a very high level, you know, it's, it's similar to the concept of edge computing, where rather than bringing all the data into one centralized source, uh, you're kind of decentralizing the responsibilities of compute, maintenance, and just uh, you know upholding the network to uh, a group of decentralized nodes, right? And these decentralized nodes are all in consensus at all times, and that's kind of why blockchain is a little slower than traditional technologies. Is that okay? Um, you you, sac- you sacrifice a little bit of the real time nature uh, mm-hmm. for unbreakable trust, right? So it's important to know that blockchain is not a panacea. It's not a silver bullet that's going to solve everything. Sure. But for the processes, especially multi-stakeholder processes where trust is broken, or rather trust has to be reestablished at every single point down the value chain, mm-hmm. starting with a single version of the truth that everyone can operate on and can collectively verify as true, uh, this is going to spark a lot of disintermediation uh, in the IoT space. Um, so that's what we're really looking forward to. It's not just you know using blockchain to fix issues in the traditional IoT space, mm-hmm. but this is really going to spark a lot of you know, user-centric, user-owned micro-economies that will grow and grow and grow um, as the machine economy kind of becomes a reality. Right. To take that one step further, how does it, how does it work? Or how would you explain kind of how it works to somebody who's maybe not technical? Right. So blockchains, the network itself is collectively maintained. Uh, There's this concept called mining. Um, People that are familiar with Bitcoin uh, understand that mining in the Bitcoin network is actually a very energy intensive process. Um, The way that they do mining and consensus is every time uh, there's a new block, every block holds a certain set of transactions and is added to a blockchain. This is the longer chain. Um, And basically, because all the transactions are sequenced and added and collectively hosted by a group of decentralized nodes, anyone can verify the history of the chain, uh, which is why people consider it to be a great ledger technology. Um, But what uh, other uh, the, the evolution of blockchain has now reached the point where it's not only being used as a ledger, but it's also used as a a shared computing platform where it's not only these nodes are collectively storing the history of the ledger, but they're also collectively executing all the processes on the platform. And this makes it, again, verifiable by anyone. So when we think about this concept and we apply it to the Internet of Things, the really big opportunities are the ones where, again, trust is lacking today. And that exists across uh, many different flavors, right? Between corporations and users, between users and other users, uh, between businesses and other businesses. And eventually, as you know, machines become more intelligent and more smart, uh, machines will need to trust other machines before transacting with each other. Right. So blockchain is really a bridging technology to build trust across all of these stakeholders that don't necessarily trust each other based on the fact that everything in the network is verifiable. Okay. So basically how does, uh, I guess to expand on this a little bit further, how does, um, 
blockchain, you know, play an active role in IoT? Like what problems is it helping solve and how is it potentially in the future going to kind of play a larger role versus how it's kind of contributing and playing a role now? Absolutely. You know, we talked a little bit about how blockchain can help IoT, but, you know, let's talk a little bit too about uh, how IoT can help blockchain, right? So mm-hmm. envision a few, we all envision a future that's powered by, you know, autonomous and intelligent machines. Um, today, uh, these machines are owned by corporations and people that use these machines are definitely the products, right? Uh, in the future, uh, when we have more machines powered by secure hardware, things like vending machines, robo taxis, 3D printers, even solar right. panels, things right. that can really autonomously generate data and value. We need to make sure that this value doesn't flow to these omnipotent institutions, but rather flows to the everyday people and businesses uh, that are owners of these devices. Mm-hmm. And going back to the, the single version of the truth that blockchain enables, it's really about you know making sure that all of the activities of a machine including the data it generates, the value it generates, is persisted on a blockchain so that mm-hmm. that's transparent and understood. There's no black boxes in the blockchain world, right? So it's really adding transparency into a lot of these business models and really going to introduce brand new business models that disintermediate uh, some companies there. So, you know, when we think about a future where, you know, we can have trusted robots that right. deliver verifiable data and verifiable right. services. Blockchain is really going to be the tool that transparently ensures users and not corporations are the benefit of these new solutions. Now, let me ask you, uh, before we get into some use cases here, are there any particular industries or kind of, I guess, segments of industries that are most likely to be um, more positively impacted by blockchain technology when it comes to IoT? Or in, at the same, in the same breath, are there any industries that maybe are, will not be as affected by um blockchain or maybe not need blockchain, I guess is the way to ask that. Yeah, I think to answer this question, I always think about two things, right? Where the money is and where the headlines are, right? Mm -hmm. Um, These two kind of things really exemplify areas where trust is really, really needed, right? Uh, When you're dealing with high value use cases, for example, if you had a supply chain use case being powered by blockchain, um, if you're trying to secure and verify that you know, diamonds or, you know, heavy machinery that's worth millions of dollars is transported in a trusted way, you know, right. using blockchain as the technology that can add trust to that process is more important than if you're dealing with something like, you know, shipping fruit, right? Of course, sure. there's a lot sure. of trust issues with shipping fruit, but the value uh, that we're talking about is, you know, uh, is, is very different, uh, even orders of magnitude off. Uh, but the other place, I think an important intersection to look at is, you know, where the high value use cases are, but also where trust is absent today, right? When we think about, especially in the consumer space, mm-hmm. um, the most sensitive types of data today are definitely things that have to do with our homes sure. and our bodies. Right. Um, so our health data and our smart home data, all of these devices we use on a daily basis really have to question, you know, First of all, do we trust the claims of the companies uh, that are issuing these devices? Um, and if they aren't verifiable, you know, how can we really be sure? And then finally, you know, all of the data and value, you know, it's no secret that big tech has benefited a lot from the data of users in the social media space for the past uh, years. And now as their footprint extends into our smart homes and our offices and our smart cities, we also right. have the question, why is that data owned by corporations and not us. You know, I think there's sure. a really interesting stat that I always look back at. It's, you know, the IoT by 2025 is going to be generating 80 zettabytes of data. A zettabyte is 1 trillion gigabytes. Okay. And, you know, why is that data not owned or even fractionally owned by the users that generate it, especially because yeah. they're kind of derivatives of our daily activities? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on some of the kind of the more use case or product side pieces that you just kind of alluded to. So, you know, we're talking about how data is obviously super important. Security of the data is, you know, just as if not more important. And But it often seems to be a relatively overlooked piece of the equation when it comes to IoT. And oftentimes it is masked by the functionality and the features that we see with with um with these devices that get put out on the market, especially for the consumers, enterprise might be a little bit different. Um, but you know, enter, uh, consumers are easily distracted by the 
benefits it provides them or the cool technology, you know, what it allows them to do that they couldn't do before. And security is oftentimes, and security of their data is oftentimes an afterthought or just not well enough understood. Uh, so how do you see this helping play a role in that, um, I guess, conf- I don't want to say confusing, but um, lack of understanding education on behalf of the consumer um, and do you have any kind of, I guess, products in house or anything that you guys have worked on developed that's worth kind of talking about how it compares to maybe something else in the market with blockchain being used? Absolutely. You know, I think as far as the consumer uh, perspective goes, um, you know, consumers today are not really well versed in IoT, even don't right. even know what the acronym means necessarily. Sure. Right. So um, there's a common saying here uh, in Silicon Valley that, you know, a product has to be 10 times better than the incumbent to replace it as an alternative, but that's extremely objective, right? So for people mm-hmm. that are thinking about a better product as ones that, you know, maybe uh, a flying camera or, you know, the newest bells and whistles, you know, that kind of audience is very hard to have focus on the security and privacy that's kind of lacking in their devices. But there's a growing faction of people, especially in the consumer space that are recognizing the importance of privacy and the importance mm-hmm. of security today. Um, and those are really the people that we're trying to target really as early adopters into this, right? I think right. that a lot of these services that we're talking about uh, may be a little bit inconvenient and maybe a little slower now um, in the blockchain space, but eventually, you know, the scalability and uh, the flexibility of this technology will, will grow, right? And that's really what we're banking on is as the desire for privacy in the consumer space grows, the demand for infrastructure that can empower devices that have this kind of user centric and privacy feel to them uh, will become much, much higher in demand. And this is something that we've already started. So a great product to kind of uh, capture what we're talking about today is the first product we ever launched on our platform. It's called UCAM. It was developed in partnership with a security camera manufacturer named Tenvis, who's been around since 2005. And they came to us looking not for you know, a flying camera or the newest bells and whistles, but they looked, they came to us looking for security and privacy as the next big feature. So Mm -hmm. what we did is we replaced, uh, alongside Tenvis, we worked with them to replace the traditional email password login mechanism and replace it with this concept of a decentralized identity. And the real important part of this is that this decentralized identity is something that only the owner has, or only the camera owner will, will have access to. Uh, as the platform provider, IOTEX never has access to what's called the user's private key. And okay. as the hardware provider, Tenvis also never has access to that private key. So this is really the key to self-sovereignty uh, as far as a device is concerned. But we didn't stop there, right? We did not only you know gave users a brand new login mechanism, but we also take that user's private key, which is one of one, and again, exclusively owned by the user, and right. we use it to end to end encrypt all the videos that come from UCAM. Okay. Um, all the processing is done on the edge, meaning on the camera itself or the user's mobile device. Uh, so we completely remove the concept of centralized processing with it. And um, what the result is, you know, this combination of blockchain, end-to-end encryption, and edge computing, it right. really enables us to make claims like no one can see your videos except you. Whereas other security camera manufacturers in the industry can only say things like, we care about your security and privacy. So it's exactly. more of the absolute solution to sure. uh, a big problem today that, you know, security cameras are being breached left and right. And no one really knows uh, what's being done with their data behind the scenes. With UCAM, you can be sure that this device works exclusively for you and you are the only one uh, that owns and controls the videos that come from it. How do you see the education piece playing into this? Because it's, it takes, I think it would take a decent amount of effort to shift the narrative over to kind of that conversation around the security of data, because people just get so easily influenced and distracted and swayed into spending money on the cool new tech and features. And they're kind of like, ah, security, I kind of just trust that they'll take care of it. But in reality, oftentimes it's not the case. So what do you think needs to be done going forward to help educate the market as to why this is an important piece of technology that you need to be looking into before you're buying a, um, 
a product that you're going to put in your home or a solution in general in the IoT space. I'm just kind of curious to get your thoughts on, on what's needed and where you kind of see this all going. Absolutely. I'm a really big believer in the concept that opportunity is when timing meets preparation, right? Um, a funny story is, you know, we brought UCAM to CES uh, 2020 uh, last year when it was still live in Las Vegas. And we actually won the CES Innovation Award for cybersecurity and personal privacy for UCAM. Okay. And this was at a time when the headlines were flooded. I mean, flooded with people being hacked yeah. and you know, people pretending sure. to be Santa Claus and talking to people through um, right. different types of security cameras in the market, right? right. Um, but, and we thought we were gonna see yes and we we're gonna you know, sell out and it was gonna be the biggest product there. But the acknowledgement to your point of security and privacy as something important, even though the, the headlines are flooded with these kinds of things, it really required a tipping point as far as consumer acknowledgement that, you know, when WhatsApp, for example, says they have end to end encryption, it actually means something different than when Signal or Telegram say that they have end to end encryption. Right. And going back to the point about timing, I think right now in 2021, we're starting to see the tipping point, not necessarily in privacy protecting smart devices, but we're seeing it in privacy protecting messengers like WhatsApp. Uh, there's a huge migration going on uh, between WhatsApp to private messengers that are more decentralized in nature, such sure. as Signal and Telegram. I think right. something to the tune of 30 million users migrated from WhatsApp to Telegram. And this is really starting to you know, show that the consumer awareness of real privacy and, you know, not trusting the claims that you, you hear in the headlines all the time, mm -hmm. um, really doing the research to understand, you know, it's kind of like before you put some food in your body, you're going to read the nutrition facts. People are starting right. to acknowledge right, right. the inner workings of these devices or okay. of these messengers. Right. And going back to that point where I was talking about earlier, people will gravitate towards solutions where uh, it's managing the most sensitive parts of their daily lives, right? So messengers, the things that you talk about with your friends behind closed doors is a right. natural first step, right? But very quickly, starting with the devices that manage the most sensitive data about our daily lives, which mm -hmm. are things like security devices, such as our cameras and our locks, the wearables that we put on that track our biometric information and other things that you know are considered to be very, very sensitive by the masses. I right. think we're going to see a wave of acknowledgement that just like we're privatizing our messengers, we should also think about where our security feeds are going and what people uh, are potentially doing with them behind the scenes. Right. Um, I think there's been an, another, you know, inflow of, you know, horror stories about, you know, ADT employees, man in the middle attacking and, you know, watching people in their most private, intimate settings. Right. Um, and, you know, it only takes, you know, you never know where the tipping point is, but we're definitely building up towards it. There's going to be a point where people understand that there's an alternative that doesn't treat their data like this. And we're just looking forward to that day and preparing for it. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's gonna be a really interesting kind of progression to see us overcome that. It's not really overcoming. I think it's more of just better balancing the promotion of the features and benefits that I uh uh, device provides as well as the security. And I think as these devices become more, um, more popular and are kind of installed in more people's homes, you're going to get a, I think that the user base is going to naturally get smarter and better understand what to look for. And I think a conversation like this goes a long way in helping um, educate people on what they should be looking for. So the last question I have before we wrap up here is just if I'm a consumer, when I'm going to look for devices uh, or, you know, smart home devices, you know, whatever it may be, what questions either should I be asking or have in my head and what things should I be looking for when I'm reading through um, different products to decide which to purchase? Once I've kind of narrowed it down on the feature set that I'm looking for, what, what should I be really focusing on on the data side and security side? Absolutely. I mean, the, a great place to start is the certifications that it has. You know, I think okay. that uh, we're already starting to see a lot of this in the in the in the, uh, the application space, right? Apple has announced new privacy labels uh, for their applications. Um, we have new GDPR and CCPA requirements that are really requiring disclosure from different websites about what data that they do collect and how it's being used. But in reality, these are not enough to 
stop the problem. You know, privacy regulations like GDPR and CCPA are great reactive mechanisms that allow people to, you know, seek financial remediation after the fact that their privacy has been breached. Um, right. But I think that looking towards ways that customers can proactively protect their privacy, meaning not give their data up to companies that don't disclose exactly how they're going to use it. Um, you know, these things are starting to become uh, more of the norm, uh, especially mm-hmm. in in Europe with GDPR, starting with CCPA in California and probably expanding into um, the, the, the the rest of the United States very soon. I'm right. personally really curious to see how um, the regulators address these kinds of issues. There's also, you know, different types of IOT security regulations blooming, but with the in- introduction of brand new frontier technologies, it's really going to be an evolving um, kind of landscape from here on out. Um, yeah. So I would just suggest, you know, consumers uh, not only to look for specific keywords like end to end encryption, but also to reevaluate uh, what exactly that means and to validate those claims, right? There was a big fiasco with Zoom earlier this year where they claimed end to end encryption, but it was still client to server encryption, right? So being able to do the research, listen to the right sources of information, and just understand what device you are putting in your homes um, is really the key to protecting yourselves uh, in the future. Yeah, I totally agree. That's that's fantastic advice. I appreciate it. All the insights you shared today and kind of just, um, you know, ec- explaining how blockchain works, the value of it, the, you know, how it relates to the IoT space, where we see it going, the trends we're seeing and all that kind of stuff. That's been, this has been fantastic. Something our audience doesn't uh, get to hear t- that much about. So I think they'll appreciate it a ton. If our audience is interested in kind of learning more, speaking with you or the team, or just kind of getting a better sense of what IoTex does, what's the best way that they can kind of reach out and engage? Absolutely. You know, we'd love for people to check out the IOTEX website. It's at IOTEX.io. And also check out some of the products that are launching on our platform. Today, we talked about UCAM, which is already on the market. But we're working on a lot of other different types of devices, including asset trackers and also some different types of mining machines. Um, So if you're interested in this intersection of secure hardware and blockchain, definitely reach out. We would love to chat. Um, And you can reach out to us at hello at IOTEX.io. Fantastic. Well, Larry, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate your time and look forward to uh, getting this out to our audience to educate them on kind of what's going on in the blockchain and IoT space. Um, We'll make sure we link up all that information so that people can check out not just the company, but also the products you have uh, that you're working with and everything kind of in between. So thanks for your time and appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ryan. All right, everyone. Thanks again for joining us this week on the IoT for All podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please leave us a rating or review and be sure to subscribe to our podcast on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Also, if you have a guest you'd like to see on the show, please drop us a note at ryan.iotforall.com and we'll do everything we can to get them as a featured guest. Other than that, thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time.